Good morning. Welcome to Onalaska United Methodist Church. It is great to have you with us today. I'm glad you found your way through the pea soup out there. A uh, few announcements before we begin the service. First of all, uh, some of you may have heard that uh, Mary Koblitz's mother passed away, Alice Johnson. Uh, so please extend your sympathy to Mary. The flowers on the altar are in uh, honor of and memory of Mary. This week, Tuesday night, uh, we have a church council meeting. Uh, again, those are open to all. You're welcome to come. Um, looking ahead, we have a trunk or treat coming up. Jessica, would you like to say something about that? Yes, we do have our trunk or treat, and we need trunks and we need treats. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we need help. Um, I don't know if you have seen our table out in the new lobby. Um, it's the one with the Halloween tablecloth. Um, but we need some more trunks, and we also need some people to be a greeter or to help serve the hot dogs. There's a couple different shifts. Um, most of the shifts are about an hour and a half or so. And um, if you need some ideas for a trunk, if you think it would be fun, there is a sheet out there that also has a bunch of different ideas. And a lot of these ideas I have the decor for. So mm -hmm. like um, an art class theme or a fiesta or a safari, things like that. I have that stuff and I would just hand you a bag and you decorate the trunk. Um, so if you are willing to do something like that, please sign up on one of these sheets out in the new lobby. Candy not included, right? Yes, you bring your own candy to hand out. <laughs> That's right. All right, thank you. Uh, that is such fun. We're looking forward to doing that again this year. Dave, you wanted to say something about the men's chili and pie dinner. Could you hang on to the mic? Hum? Can you hang on to the mic? I can hold on to the mic. Okay, that's I fantastic. Got it. Everybody, uh, there's a little piece of paper in your bulletin, and that, that's about the Men's Club Chili Supper, November 5th. We need pie, sign up. There's going to be vegetarian chili, regular chili, and uh, I guess we're going to sell the gluten we take out of the vegetarian chili later in the event. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, 4 30 or 4, 4, 4 o'clock to 6 30 on November 5th. Thank you. All right, thanks. Yeah. And some people were looking for the pie sign up last week. It was not out, but it is now posted over there by the office. So you can get your name on that if you want to help there. And then, uh, Wes, uh, you were going to say something. When Wes starts moving, get out of the way. You better believe it. Uh, a couple of questions this morning. How many of you can pour a foundation, lay up a basement, frame a house, roof it, side it, and finish the interior? <laughs> we got one in the choir, Wes. All right, good. We need people like that and volunteers in mission. Um, how many of you could hold a handful of screws and hand them one at a time to somebody building a ramp and a deck for a disabled veteran? We need you in volunteers in mission. We have projects like that. We have, well, wonderful things like washing windows and sweeping floors. If you have some of these talents, we need you. If you would be willing to leave Wisconsin in January just to go to Florida, we have a trip for you. Go down there and do some uh, storm recovery. Or if February works better, how about Alabama? Yeah, it's nice down there in February. Or in March, you can go to Kentucky. I don't know if there's any moonshine down in that neighborhood, but we're Methodists, we Methodist. don't do that. Methodist, Methodist. Yeah, yeah, okay. But on the mission bulletin board by the office, there's a list of the upcoming trips. If you don't want to go that far, wait till May and come to Pine Lake. There's all sorts of projects. If you want to be a cook or a cook's helper, or just to help with the cleaning. At Pine Lake, it's two hours away. You can drive there for a day or two days or whatever. You don't have to stay the full week. We, we don't put you in shackles and lock you up. But just come and see what this volunteer and mission family can do. And something, he's going to say something about do all the good you can. Mm -hmm. some, some guy back in England said that. Mm -hmm. So this is one way you can do some of that good. 
But come join us, sign up, and join our volunteer and mission family. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Get you a big white beard and put you in a top hat, and you can be Uncle Sam. I need you. I need you. Let's go ahead now and take a moment and greet each other with the peace and grace of Jesus Christ. Good morning. Would you please join me in the call of worship, either in your bulletin or on the screen? New every, new, every, new every morning is your love, great God of might. And all day long you are working for good in the world. Stir up in us desire to serve you, to live peacefully with your neighbors, and to devote each other to your son, our son. Jesus Christ, amen. amen. And then join me with the, us with the opening hymn. It can be found in the red hymnal or on the overhead. Uh, it's 561 in the, in the red book. Jesus united by the grace, verses one through four. You may be seated. Our scripture reading today is actually right, quite familiar. It's John 15, verses 5 through 8. In the Pew Bibles, it's on page 983. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me, and I in them, bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask, you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Thus ends the reading. Uh, the children are invited to come forward. The puppets are here this morning. Good morning. This is my 
friend Leo. Good morning. How are you? Uh, no response. One more time. How are you? Good. Yeah, they're all awake. Okay, so what's happening this morning, Leonardo? Well, the puppets are going to talk about John Wesley's three simple rules. Hello. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just going to keep going. You just catch up when you can. So I have a poem about the three simple rules. Should I start? <laughs> John Wesley was a minister who traveled far and near. He spread the news of Jesus Christ so everyone could hear. He preached in fields and in the streets near factories and mines, in hospitals and prisons every day, two or three times. He taught and lived the three simple rules, which he passed on to all, a blueprint for a Christian life, which touches great and small. The first rule is to do no harm, to heal instead of bruise, do not hurt what God created. Unconditional love you'll use. The second rule is do good to everyone you meet. Love your enemies as yourself. Help strangers on the street. Stay in love with God. Use daily worship, studies, and pray so we can learn, respond, and teach to living by God's way. Compare our love to stones. When they're thrown into the lake, their ripples spread out to the world and great changes they do make. And what we'd like you to do now is to sing the Stay in Love with God, which is part of um, John, John Wesley's song. Oh, it should be, on the, should be on the screen. No, that was for the kids. <laughs> But thank you very much. <laughs> so the kids, the words are here or on the screen, so let's all sing with the puppet, should we? Thank you for coming. Yep, it was a pleasure.
Amen. It's a blessing to have the puppets back. Uh, let's give them another round of applause. We love weekly to feature God moments, testimony, and uh, witness by folks who are part of our congregation about the ways that God has moved in their lives or challenged them. And today, um, we welcome Kelly and Loretta Dunn. Uh, they are relatively new to our community. You've moved down from the Twin Cities and uh, have joined our church. Uh, and this is a great chance for us to get to know them a little bit. Thank you. Hello. My name's Loretta Dunn. My husband Kelly and I moved to Onalaska last year, and we joined this church this past July. We've been blessed with a son and a daughter, and on the screen should be our two adult children with Kelly and our grandchild. Both of our children were born in a Methodist hospital. Both were baptized and then confirmed in a Methodist church. Both were very active in the church as they grew up. They always participated in Sunday school, VBS, children's and youth choirs, bell choir, mission trips, and were part of the youth group. After graduating from Hudson High School, one went to a Baptist university, the other went to UW La Crosse. One has a doctorate and one has a PhD. We're very proud. We can now, one can now be married in the Methodist church by a UMC pastor, one cannot. One could serve the church as a pastor. The other could not serve or be ordained. One is welcomed and affirmed by the United Methodist Church. The other is called incompatible with Christian teaching in the UMC Book of Discipline. When our children were baptized, we committed to raise them in the church. As parents, we'd like for them to be Christians. Kelly and I believe that our children both are compatible with Christian teaching. In high school and college, my son regularly prayed to God to make him straight. It's called praying the gay away. God did not answer those prayers. So in 2008, when he was a junior in college, Trevor came out to me in Loretta, and he told us that he was a gay man. A weight was removed from his shoulders he began to accept him as God made him. Fortunately, we offered unconditional love, then we hugged and cried. Thus, he began his slow journey to come out that continues on to this day. It was a few months later in 2008 when I first learned that the policies of the global United Methodist Church discriminated against gay and lesbians. That was the moment when we feel that the Holy Spirit first encouraged Loretta and I to share our stories with others. Our church in Minnetonka went through a reconciling process in 2010 and became a reconciling church. Membership in that suburban church began to grow. Our personal faith deepened as we focused on the love of Jesus. Loretta and I have a small extended family. In addition to our two children and our granddaughter, I have one brother and one brother-in-law. My brother has three kids, and he's now a retired Methodist pastor. My brother-in-law happens to be gay. And when you get together, family weddings are one of those special occasions. As Christian parents, you dream that one day your child can be married by their pastor in their church. When it was time for our nieces and our nephews to get married, my brother would perform the marriage ceremonies in his local church. He also officiated at our daughter's wedding back in 2013. Each wedding day was a celebration for our family. Loretta and I still struggle with church policies that offer marriage to one child and not to the other. To us, it rep represents an altar for some. We believe that God wants all people to have the opportunity to be in a long-term, committed, exclusive, loving relationship. We call that an altar for all. So what would happen now if my son decided he wanted to get married, if he found somebody that he loved? He's, atten he's attended every church or every family wedding, and he's witnessed the joy of those events. He was a groomsman in his sister's wedding. Yet he's the only one in our extended family facing this form of discrimination by the church that baptized and confirmed him. 
So, as you've heard, any Methodist church pastor who officiates at a same-sex marriage could possibly be brought to a church trial and risk being kicked out of the church. So my brother, he could choose to reject that policy and instead follow Christ and perform the marriage for my son. But Houston, actually on Alaska, we have a problem. For you see, when marriage equality was being debated in Minnesota in 2012, the night before the statewide vote on a constitutional amendment, my brother, the pastor, sent a lengthy email message to family members. In the email message, he rejected same-sex marriage based upon his understanding of scripture, and this email read like a sermon. Our son was already anxious about the vote, and our son was devastated by that message that he felt was targeted towards him. Loretta and I were shocked as well. And then the next summer, after same-sex marriage was approved in Minnesota, my brother would go on to remind my son that it was still against UMC policy for Methodist pastors to perform same-sex marriages, even though now they were legal in Minnesota. My brother, sadly, did not understand the depth of hurt that he had inflicted on my son and on us. In Luke 23, verse 34, Jesus is on the cross looking down and he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Some Christians do not see the immense harm that they cause in the lives of real people who happen to have a sexual orientation different from themselves. Sadly, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people and those who support them hear these messages from some vocal Christians every day. So finally in 2015, Loretta and I invited my brother and his wife to our home for a respectful conversation. We shared the struggle of our son and the pain that he felt. Later, my brother would recognize how his words had hurt our son, but unfortunately it was too little and too late. The damage had been done. My son has left the church and most of his straight and queer friends also do not attend churches. Being gay is just one aspect of his life, and after years of counseling, he's been helped to accept himself for who he is. He's now focused on his career decisions and getting on with his life on the East Coast. Loretta and I still have dreams for our son. We want him to fall in love with someone that he can spend the rest of his life. It would be great if he could find a safe church home that fully affirms him. Today, my brother is somewhat more understanding of LGBT people. He and his wife, you know, they try to be very nice to our son, who they've known since his birth. But they're content with their view of love the sinner, hate the sin. I continue to pray that one day they will understand. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing your story. And I, I know that there are others who have stories similar to that. Um, we're going to continue now with our prayer of confession. You'll find this in the bulletin or on the overhead. Um, this is a, a responsive confession. In this case, you guys will lead and I will follow. So let's begin. Lord, we confess our day-to-day -day failure to be truly human. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we confess that we often fail to love with all we have and are, often because we do not fully understand what loving means, often because we are afraid of risking ourselves. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we cut ourselves off from each other and we erect barriers of division. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we confess that by silence and ill-considered word, we have built up walls of prejudice. Lord, we confess that by selfishness and lack of sympathy, we have stifled generosity and left little time. 
for others. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us listen to your word of forgiveness, for we are very deaf. Come, fill this moment, and free us from sin. Amen. Well, this month we are talking about Jesus' command from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 23 and 24. 
that we need to be reconciled to one another before we go to the altar. And an area where our uh, United Methodist denomination has been torn is on inclusion of LGBTQ people. Now, I want to commend Kelly and Loretta because they talked about how they made the effort to be reconciled uh, with your brother on this. And even though it may not have gone as far as you wanted, it was a good first step. So thank you on that. Uh, in the United Methodist Church, our book of discipline uh, says two things in the same paragraph. Uh, it says that all people are created in God's image and are worthy of love and are welcome in the church. And then it says that the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. That's kind of hard to hold those two in tension. At the last general conference early in 2019, a slight majority of global Methodists voted to double down on that incompatibility language, prohibit the ordination of gay pastors, and enact harsh penalties for pastors who perform same-sex marriages. Now, for those of you who watched the live stream of General Conference 2019, I'm sorry. <laughs> you saw some of the most hateful language and behavior on both sides of the issue. In fact, uh, um, Wednesday after General Conference concluded, I was over at uh, Ana Terrace doing a worship service and uh, one of our seniors who lives there came in and he was very excited because he had live stream General Conference and he thought it was terrific entertainment. And he was moving on from there to watch the Mueller testimony. Yeah! <laughs> Good TV. Well, we have another general conference coming up May 5th through 15th of 2020, and this one will be up in the Twin Cities. And our own Jessica Goebel is a voting delegate from Wisconsin. She is one of uh, 900 people out of 12 million Methodists who will get to go and vote. We are all praying for this general conference and for reconciliation between the sides. But we also know that there may be division or even schism in the United Methodist Church. And so as our congregation prepares for General Conference 2020, and whatever may come out of it, we are going back to our Methodist roots and practicing reconciliation in our own pews. How can we love one another and live together even when we disagree? Now John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, gave us some useful tools that we've been talking about. First is our tradition of being a big tent. We are a church where people who love God may unite and worship together even when they disagree on lesser points of doctrine and scripture and interpretation. We also have the quadrilateral, which is a wonderful fourfold tool for determining God's will using scripture and tradition of the church and reason and experience. And then we have Wesley's three general rules for the people called Methodist. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. And we've ex been expanding on the three rules. This week we're going to look especially at the second rule, do good. You see, John Wesley and Charles Wesley and the early Methodists were less interested in dry and dogmatic religion, uh, a religion of rules, than they were in a heartfelt and practical religion. Love with its boots on, uh, ready to go to work. And John Wesley actually took that second rule and kind of expanded it into a whole system, and he's rather famous for it. Uh, John Wesley's expanded rule is printed on the front of your bulletin. It's on the screen. Why don't we read this together? Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Oh, do we leave anything out of there? I think we got it. Now, consequently, the early Methodists engaged in missions to an unusual degree as they attempted to do all the good they could. They visited prisoners. They cared for the sick. They educated children. They helped lift poor people out of poverty. John Wesley, who was an Oxford professor and an Anglican priest and kind of a bookworm, was not that comfortable doing these things, but he found that he experienced a heartwarming faith when he took his knowledge and beliefs and when he put them into action. And so he made a personal commitment and he called upon the people called Methodists to do so as well. 
Now, consequently, the United Methodist Church, our denomination, has a very rich heritage of vital mission and outreach. For instance, in Africa, we built the first, and I think it may still be the only, pan-African college, Africa University. And it is a place where Methodists and others from across the continent uh, can come and develop leadership skills and friendships, which help to bring peace to war-torn countries. Here in Wisconsin, we sponsor retirement homes, adoption agencies, college ministries, on and on. And vital missional outreach, serving in all the ways we can, to quote our vision, is at the core of our local church as well. On Alaska, UMC feeds 100 or more people at the community dinner every month. Our own Harvey Witzenberg uh, helped organize the Cooley Region Hunger Walk uh, last weekend, which raised over $14,000 for La Crosse area food pantries. That's something to applaud. And we send off at least three mission teams every year, at least three mission teams every year to do good work across the United States and sometimes even overseas. And all of this is entirely in keeping with Jesus' teaching. In our reading from John 15 today, Jesus uses the analogy of a grapevine. He describes himself as the strong and vital vine, the roots and the trunk that nourish and connect us. We are the branches charged with bearing fruit. And if we get cut off from Christ, then we just dry out and we become useless dead wood. But as long as we stay connected firmly to Christ and to one another, then we bear bountiful fruit. And fruitfulness is an essential test of Christian faith. Jesus says, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Now this is how we know that we are disciples if we're bearing fruit. And this is how the world knows that we are disciples, when we are bearing fruit. And this is how we know when God is doing a new thing, if it bears fruit. Remember the Wesleyan quadrilateral, our four-part tool for interpretation and reinterpretation of faith and scripture? Well, the four parts are scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Experience is the fruit test. Have we seen this faith that we have, this understanding that we have, bearing fruit and making a real difference for positive good in the world? The experience of fruitfulness is what led the early church to set aside the Old Testament scriptural bans against Gentiles, specifically the requirement for circumcision and dietary restrictions against pork. Um, I'm going to digress for a moment and, and tell a joke. I'm sorry. This is one of my favorites. So a, uh, a uh, Catholic and a, pastor, a priest and a Methodist pastor and a rabbi are having a conversation about evangelism and, and which faith is the most effective at uh, uh, making converts. And they decide that to test this, they're living in the north woods of Wisconsin for purposes of this illustration, uh, that they're going to go out to the woods and they're each going to try to convert a bear. And then they'll come back in a week and they'll report. Well, when they get back together, the, uh, uh, the priest is kind of banged up. You know, he's, he's got some band-aids and some bruises. And, and they say, what happened? And he said, well, I went out and I found a bear. And I began to uh, uh, tell it about uh, God. And it began to kind of beat on me and chew on me. But I, I sprinkled it with holy water and taught it its rosary. And now we've got a good Catholic bear. Okay. So they look at the Baptist, and he's got his arm in a cast, and he's got a bandage around his head, and he's using crutches. He's, he looks bad. And they say, well, what happened to you? He said, well, I went out in the woods, and I found me a bar, and I began to preach about hell and damnation and the goodness of God. And that bear, he began to chew on me, and, and we rolled around, and finally we flipped over into a river, and I baptized that bear, and we got us a good Baptist bear. Okay. So they turn to the rabbi, and the rabbi is in a full head-to-body cast. He's in traction, and they say, what happened to you? And the rabbi says, well, in hindsight, circumcision wasn't the best place to start. <laughs> <sighs> oh. 
So, back to our regularly scheduled sermon. In Acts chapter 10, uh, uh, the apostle Peter is sent by Jesus to a pagan household, a household uh, full of people who are not circumcised and who eat pork and break many other rules according to the Old Testament. But when the Roman centurion Cornelius and his household, men, women, children, and servants hear about Jesus, they become believers and they show clear evidence of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Apostle Paul has similar experiences with fruitful ministry among the Gentiles himself. And then in Acts chapter 15, Peter and Paul are called back to Jerusalem to testify before the council, the the first general conference, you might say, about what they have seen. And then the council, based on that fruit test of of seeing the Holy Spirit at work in the lives of these uh, Gentiles who were formerly outsiders, decide that they're going to set aside some of the Old Testament holiness code laws and welcome the new Gentile Christians. And that's good news for us, by the way, because just about everybody here this morning is a Gentile. And most of us like a good ham sandwich, right? So last week we talked about the gotcha scriptures, the six verses out of 31,000 plus in the Bible that seem to prohibit homosexuality. And they're listed in that flyer out in the lobby. What does the Bible say about LGBTQ people? Um, Some of those verses are part of the Old Testament holiness codes, uh, the same holiness codes that contain sections set aside by the Jerusalem Council and others over the years. Many scholars and interpreters now believe that others of the verses are referring not to loving, monogamous, same-sex marriage, but to sinful and harmful practices like child and sexual abuse, rape, idolatry, and promiscuity. But does the Bible contain any fruit, any evidence, positive examples of LGBTQ people whose lives are fruit-bearing? And some scholars believe it does. For instance, King David, you guys have heard of him, right? He's one of the heroes of the Old Testament. Well, early in his life, he has a relationship with Jonathan, the son of King Saul. And when Jonathan dies, David laments, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. Hmm. Or in Luke chapter 7, a pagan centurion sends to Jesus to heal his beloved servant saying, only speak the word and my servant will be healed. And the Greek word uh, that is translated servant is pace. And pace is sometimes used of a male sexual companion. Jesus does not condemn the relationship. Instead, he commends the centurion's faith and he heals the servant. And then finally in Acts chapter 8, the Holy Spirit sends Philip one of the early Christians, down the road to Gaza, and he encounters an Ethiopian eunuch riding along in a chariot and reading scripture, and the eunuch is confused by scripture, and Philip uses the opportunity to tell him about Jesus. Now, eunuchs were men who had been castrated for high government service, and they were pretty much complete outsiders uh, to society, Uh, Jewish people saw them as sexually other. They were not really male or female. And yet this eunuch comes to faith in Christ and says, look, here's water. What is to prevent me from getting baptized? And Philip gladly baptizes this social outcast who doesn't fit the sexual norm. Some examples of fruit in the Bible for LGBTQ people. Now these scriptures, by the way, are also listed in that uh, flyer. And in each case, the evidence of fruit, faith in Christ through word and deed, suggests that God has a place for LGBTQ people in the church. Now, that has been my experience as well. Some of you know that my wife is the oldest of three sisters. Uh, They come from a long line of Lutherans and people of faith, and it has definitely rubbed off. I blame her for my call to ministry, uh, because I certainly didn't have pastors in my family. Uh, My wife, Annalisa, she's the one on the right, is now a uh, pastor in the Methodist Church. 
Um, her middle sister, Alicia, uh, in the center of the photo, is uh, a pastor in the Metropolitan Community Church, and the youngest sister is married to a Missouri Synod Lutheran pastor, and they're serving in Hong Kong. And yes, they're safe right now, thank you for asking. Uh, uh, the youngest sister's not in this picture. Uh, when Alicia came out, it caused kind of a family rift. The youngest sister condemned Alicia as a practicing homosexual based on the gotcha scriptures and, and may have even said, I'm worried that you might go to hell. Alicia responded by condemning the youngest sister as being too judgmental, which is also a pretty serious sin. And for a few years, those two sisters would not talk to each other. You know who they would talk to? The Methodists in the middle, Annalisa and I. When Alicia married Judy, uh, Judy is uh, the woman to her left in the middle row, um, we went down to the wedding in Texas. That's, this picture is from the wedding. Uh, the youngest sister and her family did not go. That hurt. When we all went to a big family reunion in Minnesota at a Christian camp, Alicia and her family had to stay off site. That hurt too. Now, I'm happy to say that the sisters have since reconciled. They've set aside their theological differences in favor of loving one another, and uh, I'm uh, glad for that. Now, the Metropolitan Community Church, or the MCC that Alicia serves, was founded in 1968, the same year as the United Methodist Church, and it was created specifically as an LGBTQ-affirming denomination. They are making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. They're bearing fruit, just like we are. And Alicia has a fruitful ministry which God has blessed. I've seen two beautiful things uh, uh, during opportunities we've had to worship with Alicia at her church. One is that they really expand upon their time of joys and concerns. Now, we often talk about anniversaries and things, uh, but when we attended their church, we watched loving couples stand up and celebrate their fifth, their tenth, even their fiftieth anniversaries, and the entire congregation applauded. And that seemed a little strange to us until we realized that uh, uh, society has until very recently said that same-sex couples can't be married. And these were witnesses of faithful, fruitful, loving commitments made before God um, many years ago in some cases. Amazing testimonies of faithfulness. Another uh, wonderful experience we have had there is that when the MCC serves communion, it's their practice that family groups come up together and they serve each other. Spouses, grandparents, children, both heterosexual and homosexual couples, they lovingly share the bread and cup, the body and the blood of Christ with each other. They humbly serve each other. It really is beautiful. And it's actually uh, been an inspiration for me when we uh, have our Monday, Thursday communion service and practice family communion, bringing groups up to, to have communion together. I learned that in Alicia's church. In 2010, uh, same year that we moved here, Annalisa and I took a family vacation to Colorado. And little did we realize uh, when we went out there that Alicia was going to be installed uh, uh, as the pastor of Pikes Peak Metropolitan Community Church while we were in Colorado. And so we actually rearranged our entire vacation and drove across the state of Colorado twice so that we could be there for her installation service. And it was very humbling for me because visiting pastors are invited to lay hands on uh, uh, the pastor who's being installed, and Alicia invited me to be part of that, even knowing the, the mixed uh, history that the United Methodist Church has. Uh, I was not just invited to, I was welcomed uh, to be part of her service, and it was, it was beautiful. God is clearly moving in the LGBTQ community, it, bearing fruit in faithful lives. But in the United Methodist Church, we haven't quite fully embraced this movement of the Holy Spirit. So, friends, how can we at Onalaska United Methodist Church welcome and acknowledge the fruitful ministry of our LGBTQ sisters and brothers? Well, the reconciling process is part of the conversation. Uh, we 
have different opinions about this, and we're probably not going to change opinions about it. But what we are learning to do is try to understand that we're all trying to be faithful and that we can still love one another. We already have gifted LGBTQ members amongst us who share their gifts as musicians, teachers, leaders, and in the case of Ruth Halstead, potentially a pastor in the future. But these members have not always felt safe being open about who they are. We say as a congregation, it's part of our vision that we love all people unconditionally. But do we really? Or is there an invisible asterisk on that statement that excludes LGBTQ people? The reconciling process is intended to help us think about how we love one another, even if we disagree with each other. Our goal is to eventually have a church conference uh, in the spring where all OUMC members can vote on a welcoming statement that specifically affirms that we love and welcome our LGBTQ sisters and brothers in the life of the church. That would be truly welcoming. A step beyond that that we may also choose to take is to adopt an altar for all policy, stating that we are willing to go against that uh, line in the Book of Discipline and host same-sex weddings at the discretion of the pastor. And such a policy would finally remove that last asterisk from our vision as we would no longer discriminate against LGBTQ people who want to pledge their faithful love before God and family. Now, friends, um, in the Onalaska community, Onalaska proper, and I'm not talking about the Holman or La Crosse or other areas, there are 19 churches in Onalaska. Only two of those won't really welcome LGBTQ people. And I'm including us in that, even though we're still thinking about this. Only two. There are a lot of people in our community who don't have a church home. And we could bear some fruit here. Are we ready to take these steps and truly love all people unconditionally, as Jesus tells us we must, even when we disagree with them? Are we ready to do all the good that we can and to welcome our LGBTQ friends who are also expressing their faith by bearing good fruit? I pray that we are. Amen. Amen. We come to our prayer time. What would we like to lift up today as joys or concerns? Mm. So prayers for your kids who, who heard really bad news about their dad this week. So, okay. 
Yes. Kelly. A joy. Yes. Carol turns two tomorrow and Woo. she's doing really, really well. Excellent. Uh, uh, for those of you who may not know the history, uh, Harold has had some serious health issues and spent right. more time in the hospital probably than out of it, really. Yeah, and almost a year on chemo. And so, but yeah, things are so, looking good. That is wonderful. Glad to hear. Yes. Uh, prayers for Dale's family. Dale passed away. Uh, so prayers for Lily and Lucas, uh, premature twins uh, who... Uh, are still in the ICU, but they're improving daily. So, yeah, wonderful. Oh, there we go. I'm sorry. I had to look way up there to get all the way down to poor Pat. Okay. Uh, prayers for Mary Koblitz's family with the passing of uh, her mom, uh, Alice. Uh, prayers for peace. 61 years and six months to go. <laughs> so Jeff went back to work. Uh, uh, your grandson turned one. And, uh, and a six-month anniversary. Uh, prayers for uh, Dave's younger brother, Tim, who is making progress against pancreatic cancer. So, All right, let's go ahead and bow our heads. We'll begin with a moment of silent prayer. Lord God, you live and move and work in the world in many and various ways, and often you choose to work through us, and we are privileged to be your servants, uh, the messengers of your love, uh, strengthened by you for the task you put ahead of us. Uh, Lord, there are many needs in this world, uh, people who are sick, people who are struggling. Um, we pray that you will help us reach out to them in the ways that they need and at the times that they need so that we might do all the good that we can in the name of your love. Lord, we also give you thanks for milestones, anniversaries, celebrations. Um, uh, there is so much good in our lives and we are so blessed. Um, help us to open our eyes and remember that you are there uh, every moment of the day, not just in the bad times, but in the good times as well. We lift the prayers that have been raised uh, today up to you, knowing that uh, you will be active in each person's life uh, exactly as they need it to be. We uh, pray all these things in your name and join in the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Amen. We have a chance now to share our gifts and offerings with the Lord. Uh, the ushers will come around. Uh, if you prefer to give electronically, you can go to onalaskaumc.org slash give.
Lord God, you are worthy to receive all glory, honor, and praise, for by your will all things are created and have their being. Bless now these gifts that we offer in thanksgiving for your great faithfulness. Amen. Okay, I'm going to give the choir fair warning. We're going to skip the last hymn, so if you need to assemble, go ahead. I um, want to thank you for coming and worshiping today. Um, I hope you've been blessed by our time together. If you want to know more about this congregation where we engage in these conversations because we love one another and we really emphasis, emphasis, we emphasize putting first things first, loving God and loving our neighbors. Then ask around and the people you're sitting with can tell you more. Uh, if you would like to get together for prayer, please give me a call. I'd be happy to spend that time. Uh, I've noticed that the bells have been programmed to go off at 9.30 and let me know when I'm running late. So we're going to skip the final hymn. Uh, let me offer a blessing and then we'll go forth. Lord God, you are good. Uh, you are good all the time. And all the time you are good. Uh, we live into that goodness and we love each other. Help us to go forth confident in your blessing, full of your love and ready to serve the world. Amen. It's on.